Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 83, Confronting the Truth During Hardships, featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on June 1st, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore eschatology and navigate today's challenges in this captivating episode number 83, Confronting the Truth During Hardships. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking divine guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in scripture. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before diving into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 83, titled Confronting the Truth During Hardships, we're excited to announce the rollout of new features on our YouTube channel. We're introducing Super Chat premieres and a new merch store directly on the End Generation Project channel. You can now purchase our latest designs on a variety of merch, from hoodies to limited edition prints and posters. Stay tuned for these exciting updates coming soon. Your support through these past months has been crucial. These new features will allow us to reach more people, offer more insightful episodes, and expand our mission. By shopping with us, you're not just getting great products, you're making a meaningful impact on our community. We couldn't have come this far without the support of all our ache members and God's blessing. Visit our store now to explore our collection and help sustain our efforts. Thank you for your continued support and generosity. May the Lord your God keep you all, always. Blessings. Okay, you guys, help me out. Today. Today. Oh, by the way, I've been everywhere. Today, guys, totally immersed and uh, quite a few things and uh, actually I lost track of time I did totally lost track of time and so I thought I'd come on air I did just to one see how you guys are doing to ask you two questions only two you guys ready for those all right number one now you don't have to answer this you don't have to but uh, it is part of why we're here in the first place how many of you all feel uh, fuzzy as far as the idea of Christ being with you right now. How many feel fuzzy on that? Truthful. Truthfully. How many feel a bit uh, fuzzy on that? That's one question. Right? Maybe a bit uh, unsure about it. Listen, because I know that one time throughout the myriad of troubles in my life, right? There were often times when I wondered, I said, well, wait a minute, how is Christ with me? Because when you're not in the middle of a storm, right? When you're not in the middle of a storm, is it, that's one thing. But when you're in the middle of a storm, you may find yourself asking, Lord, uh, where are you? Right? I need you. Where are you? You may be enduring something. You may ask yourself, Lord, where are you? It happens when you're in the trouble. Now, when you're not in the trouble, we can imagine anything. We can. We can have a good day. And if, if we often assume Christ is right there, we do. When we're having a good day, the truth is we really don't need anybody, right? When everything is okay, you really don't need anybody. But when things break down, when things go wrong, when persecution comes, right? When all those things come, how many people have sat there and said, Lord, um, I need you? And I'm not sure how you're with me. I'm not sure if my prayer is good enough to be responded to. I'm not sure if I even deserve to be released from this, but I need you. Right? In other words, it's almost like a desperate plea that we give. Now, if you've ever been in trouble for real, then you should know exactly what I'm talking about. It does not happen in a time of peace. In fact, in a time of peace, we can afford to act like anybody, right? Would you guys agree? Sometimes we'll say, hey, we're fine. But in truth, we're dying the entire time, right? When nothing is happening, when you're okay, when you have everything you want, if you were to stay like that 
for the greater half of your life, that would be the time you would not be in close communication with the Lord. You wouldn't be. It's when things go wrong, right? Sometimes when you look at somebody else's life and you have no power to help that person, you can find yourself in that same situation. You may be asking the Lord for strength, some sort of resolve to help somebody else out, right? And it's just not there. Now, I'm a regular person, right? So that means when things happen in my life, I wanted to know that the Lord was, was what's the procedure, right? Lord, what do I need to do to, uh, you know, get this thing moving? Where's my comfort? Right? Truth be told, I'm hardly ever comforted in troubles. I don't look for comfort. I don't run to anybody. I don't do that. And all too often, it is me with the situation, with the Lord. And I look for him, and I won't let loose until I find him. In so doing, because I've gone through many moments like that, I found him. I did. I found him. But it's in moments of peace. We're distant, right? How many? How many did somebody said when my sons died? I went through that with a daughter. At a very young age, she died. A real young age. And it was different because I spent a lot of time, right? It, it puts you in this realm of, of questions. You know what's so fascinating is that the day after, you know what happened? The Lord gave me a truth. You know what that truth did? It caused me to smile. Do you know that? The day after, it caused me to smile. The, the day after that, it caused me to leap internally. You know, when most people lose something precious like that, they lash out at the entire world. They do. You see, I like truth. And children, they don't belong to us. They don't. We're blessed to be caretakers over souls that do not belong to us. They belong to the Most High. Those children are, in fact, your brothers and your sisters. They don't belong to you. But you were deemed to be their helper, overseer, caretaker for a time. Cherish that responsibility. Cherish that responsibility. Cherish that. Losses bring you closer to truth. They do not put you in a place which is like a wilderness. That's Hollywood. It's not real. What's real is when you face the truth. Right now, right? Um, the world is in sort of a, this weird moment. Correct? The world is. It's a weird moment. People. They have no outlet for their losses. Look at the world and look at what's happening. You would think, you would think it's because of leadership. You would think it's because of the myriad of issues that we face. No, that's not why. People have no outlet. The only true outlet is truth. Drinking is not an outlet. Pharmaceutical recreational things is not an outlet. Nature's yield Grass, weed, things like this, not an outlet. All those things do is delay the inevitable. You know what the inevitable is? You know what that is? You have to face what just happened. You have to put in perspective what happened. That's very difficult for people these days. Do you know why? It's very hard. Like in my case, how can a person... Somebody asked me that today. They said, how can you... you and this is somebody who knows me quite well. And God bless their souls. They are dusty and crusty like I am. But how can you have so many losses? And yet, your joy is never tampered with. How can that happen? This person wants to know. They are full of defeat. They tried to smile with so much losses. They tried to be kind and to be nice, dealing with so many losses. And so they asked me, how do you do that? You know what my answer was? My answer was this. In the middle of your troubles, that's when you ask that question. Never ask that in peacetime. Don't ask that question when everything is okay. You will not believe the answer. You won't. Losses can truly test us. They will let you know where you are. They will. Lord knows I've lost hundreds of people. Hundreds. Lord knows. 300, over 300 close people, and they keep going. 
It's over 300. Can you imagine that? Having the loss of over 300 close people, right? You know what it does, though? Listen to me carefully. It causes you to see the truth. When you lose a person, the first thing you think is, oh, that person's gone. I won't see that person anymore. And it hurts. You may miss the person. When you lose another, same thing happens. You start losing other people. You're forced to see the truth. And what is that truth? That first and foremost, no one is promised tomorrow. There are too many people I've had plans with, right, in the future. They were not in the future. They weren't. They never made it. When you deal with loss, you start facing the absolute truth. You know what that truth is? It's a very simple truth. People rebel against this truth. People fight and do everything they can to avoid this one truth. Do you know what that is? It's very simple, too. It's very simple truth. You ready? Let God be God. Let God be God. How simple. How do you do that? That's when you see who the Father is and you realize, wait a minute. The Creator created everything. He created everything. The stars. He created all the elements. He created everything. We live within His creation. We are His creation. He made humanity with autonomy, with the ability to reproduce. He grants bodies, souls. It's his creation, his creation. We all too often forget that. And because it's his creation, like, for example, if, if I had a desk and say I had a bunch of electronic components on this desk and I had a capacitor that blew out, Right? And if those electronic components could talk to one another, they may be sad because that capacitor blew out. They may miss the capacitor. So while they're missing the capacitor because I want the whole thing to work, I replace it with another. Take the old capacitor. Right? They don't know my plans. All they know is what they see. They don't know that I crank the voltage up to see at what point that capacitor would blow. They don't know that. They don't know that that one capacitor actually tried the entire circuit. Even the, even the ones that like that capacitor, just like us, we don't know that when we are close to someone and they pass, we're the ones undergoing a process, not the person who passes. The person who passes has finished their race. So why are you in proximity to the one who passes? Because you're the one undergoing something. Can you all see that? The person who passes is not undergoing anything. They have finished their race. But why are you around when the person passes? Because that was for you. That was your moment. That's going to lead to something. It is true that when you create something, right, all the different parts and everything that you make, they cannot create themselves. You have assembled them into something useful. And if you want that to continue to be useful, you assemble it with great care, just like you're made with great care. Right? Great care. Everything you undergo in life, everything that you see in life is a bit different than you think. Some people think things are just in operation. I found that to be impossible. So discern, they found that out big time. They found out things that they, they can't, they don't want the answer to what they have found. They don't want it. Every time they discover something that implies it's been under control the entire time, they don't like it. They're trying to find, scientists have always been trying to find a key that states this element here just came out of a randomness or this element here simply exists and does a bunch of things to this element to cause this random thing over here. They do not like the idea that things are controlled. They don't like that. In the 80s, they found that out. In 2022, they proved it. 2023, they proved it. 2024, everybody proved it. How did they prove that? I'll give you a simple demonstration back to my conversation. There, was a, there were some people in Japan, right? On a mountain, isolated from everything. How do we know this? They were inside of a mountain. There were people in the USA inside of a mountain. And that was on the East Coast. Right through one of the tunnels, I believe when you're when you're uh, uh, going up towards Pennsylvania from Virginia, right through one of those tunnels. So you have one in one mountain, one in another mountain. No light can get to either one, no radio signals, no anything else. And they have some small 
tiny, teeny, tiny particles, small ones. Now, these particles are important because it, it will orientate itself based on the magnetic poles of the Earth, but they're opposites. So what does that mean? That means because they're opposites, only one of those group of elements, right? Japan had the mirror set. The USA had the dominant set. So, of course, it operated like we see normal, you know, things operate with magnetism. But the one in Japan operated opposite the one in the USA, no matter what the poles were doing. Guess what happened when they moved? Each particle they moved, the particles in Japan at the exact same time, as though they were connected, also moved in the opposite direction. They kept doing it. They kept measuring to see if it was real. They found it was real. So one, you move one, and the other one responds with the opposite movement. They went further. They stuck one on the ISS, right? Random places here on Earth. They had the master copy here on Earth. They had the mirror version on the ISS. Same thing happened. They swapped them. Same thing happened. They put them close. Same thing happened. They put them far apart. Same thing happened. And this is natural. Can you imagine having a, having a golf ball, right? You move one golf ball counterclockwise, and the other golf ball moves clockwise. Same, um, same angle, same speed, same force, same everything. Then you move it again, and it happens again. At the exact same time as though they're connected by some unknown force. You can't get hold of, but there is no force that can interrupt them. And they've found something larger. By the way, that experiment took place a long time ago. They've had others. Oh, they've stuck stuff. You know, these, um, uh, these um, like, like the James Webb telescope, do you not know that they have a packet, very special package on these telescopes? Do you not know that they continue to measure this same phenomena? And it works no matter the distance. They know that by Voyager. They know that through all spacecraft that have been launched. Because a packet only weighs half an ounce. And that's the container that houses the particulate and the sensors, of course, right? So that means, wait, that means if you control one particle, the other particle responds at the exact same time with the exact opposite movement, no matter where it's at. Then they found out the master element does things on its own. In fact, they found out all elements do things on their own. So for the first theorem now proven it's like a theorem and it's proven they found out other things are connected the same way but they don't know where the control spot is who has the master elements they don't know they're finding out the same things at CERN and they're trying so desperately to unlock what the control element is to these forces they can find the exact same forces all day see when they keep running the same experiment over and over and over and over and over again at some point you'll say well what are they doing they're not doing anything. What if they're just running the same experiment over and over again. No, these guys are hunting. They are looking. They need the control element. You know what that means? That means if you can somehow take control over the control element, you'd be the most powerful person on this earth. You could reverse anything you wanted to reverse on this earth. You could cure anything you wanted to cure. You could do the unbelievable if you could find out where the control element is. And they're hunting, and they'll never stop. They're not going to stop. They're not. Right? They're hunting desperately. Are they close? No closer than they were, you know, yesterday. They're hunting them. That, that's partly why they have that statue up there. That's what that statue stands for. Why? These same experiments are in the old writings in India. Yes, that means India. Believe it or not, those people in India are the smartest people on the planet. Just so you know that. They have a mental capacity to do things the average person cannot do because they have a strong desire in certain areas. That's why. Your brain is no different than theirs, right? The truth is, each and every one of you can be super intelligent if you so desired. But somebody answered me something. What's in the way of your super intelligence? Anybody who did terrible in school, right? If you did terrible in school, but you're not, you know, you're not dumb or anything. You just didn't do good in school. Don't you remember why? I know why you did terrible in school. Do you know why? If you did terrible in any specific subject, I know why you did bad. Now, you may argue in front of everybody else. You may. 
if you want to be right about it. But I'm telling you, I know why. I know why. I know why. You ready? Your emotions. That's why. That's why. Think about it. Pause. Take a pause. Think about it. Your emotions. Your emotions. Your emotions. Your emotions. What you are feeling. You got in the way. Stopped your concentration. Caused you not to commit. Right? Zapped your energy. You start thinking about other things trying to be stimulated in other areas of life. And that subject was not doing it. Emotions. 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 They had a test on emotions. They can actually zap you of your emotions where you don't have any. Do you know that? In other words, they can, they can make you, it, it, it's almost like your emotions go dormant. They can do this to anybody. This can be done to anybody. Now, in every single case, and they even work with them, with people with real brain damage, people who, were, who had real damaged parts of the brain, when they cause the emotional sets and subsets to go away, to stop, to become dormant, the person had this incredible capacity to remember everything. It's an amazing thing. They had nothing to distract them from remembering everything, and all of them drooled at the same time. Isn't that funny? They drooled. They actually drooled. So they would look at something. Right? Some of the people who couldn't read, instantly, they began to recall everything they saw previously, and they started putting things back together. Now, when they had that test on the, the, the mentally, they called them mentally retarded at the time, right? But they had that same test on them. Remarkable findings. Remarkable findings. Funny thing in it. Because emotions, that's how we, things stick in our memory. Think of the worst moment in your life. Isn't it something wrapped with a lot of emotions? Think about it. You can't forget it because of all the emotions. Think about it. Think about it. It was an emotional time. And it just so happens, that's what you remember. Think of the best time in your life. The best time in your life that stimulated everything within you. It may be a beautiful memory, right? You can't forget it. But here's the funny part. Do you remember how you felt during that time? I'll tell you what, you can only describe it. You cannot bring back all the emotions. Because if you brought back all the emotions, you would be back in that spot again. Like, like somebody hypnotized you. You would recall every single detail. Because the truth is, you've never forgotten anything you ever saw. You just can't recall it. Why? Because they found out it takes emotions to recall what you have seen. Hmm? People that uh, had a hard time with math- mathematics. Do you remember the irritation you felt? Some people did this with computer programming. They found out that a lot of people have this condition when it comes to programming. Right? When it comes to, now listen, this is so funny. Guys, now don't jump for joy and say, I knew I was right about something. But, but, but they found this out with people who are involved with computer programming. It's a handicap, actually. It is the reason why a lot of people can't do it. Programming is a language that you speak with a bunch of instructions. Now, if you write instructions, you can never embellish the story. For example, right? How would you make some toast? Say you were going to program something in a computer to make some toast and you needed to have the instructions everybody give me the first step how do you make toast what's the first step anybody tell me that what's the first step i want you to see this what's the first step making toast what is it what is it in making toast somebody says get the bread out somebody says buy bread somebody says slice bread go get the bread out right all these different things about bread. That's my, that's the whole thing right there, right? The, the first thing you think of, bread. That's the first thing you think of, right? Not the first thing I think of. But it is toast, right? But first thing you think of is bread. You didn't think of the oven. You didn't think of turning on the oven or anything else. You didn't think of the pot. You thought of the bread. The major component in making toast is bread. So you assume, hey, you got to have bread first. Why not the oven first? Well, not the toaster first. Why the bread first? Right? You got to make sure everything is there. Suppose you're writing instructions to someone. They're going to listen to everything you say. And say, we get past the bread and we get past the pots and pans and everything else, right? So you got everything you need. What is the next step after you have everything you need? The very first step in making toast would be you have everything you need. So what is the first step in actually making the toast? What is the first step? What's the answer? 
Somebody give me the answer. The very first step, the thing that everybody does, what do they do? They butter the toast, right? They butter the toast. They have all their utensils, tools, and everything else out. What's the first thing they do? Somebody says heat. Somebody says plug in the toaster. Somebody says push the button down, right? That's what they're saying. So somebody says, you, you remember, you got all your equipment. So we can all agree it's pretty simple that you have to turn on your oven. If you have an oven, turn it on. Suppose you got a toaster, right? You got a toaster. So the next step is to put the bread in, right? Isn't that the next step? Easy, correct? That's easy, right? Now, a computer would not understand that. Would not understand that. Why not? Because you never told anybody how to take that bread and get it to the toaster. You forgot the most important steps. How do you get the bread to the toaster? That's programming. How do you get that bread to the toaster, right? Then when you put the toast in, after you get the toast in and you push the lever down and it's heating up, then what? What do you do? What do you do then? Once the toast, once the oven or the, the toaster is actually, it's working and the bread's in there, what do you do? What do you do? Something we all do. What do you do? Somebody says, wait. Somebody else says, wait, right? Now, that's, that's nice. But if you tell a computer to wait, you just kill the whole program. It's not going to do anything else. So what is the true answer? Wait until, wait until you have to have a condition, a conditional statement right? You wait until. Now, if you make do it fancy, you have options. You wait until toast reaches this condition or toast reaches that condition or toast reaches this condition. You can, you know, and you keep going until it reaches one of those conditions. When it reaches one of those conditions, then you do the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step. That's programming, right? Very simple, right? Here's the problem. They found out that people, when they try to do that, if a person does not like to be told what to do, they make very poor programmers. They can get the, now they can get the, 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 the major steps, but as soon as they put the code in a computer and they have a debug error, they start losing their cool. They'll start saying things like, I don't understand why this error keeps popping up. Well, a computer is very simple. It's only going to do what you tell it to do. So a person who likes to give orders but that same person who does not like to take orders, they make poor programmers. They get angry at the computer, right? So they don't last too long. What about people who can take orders? They can do very, quite well, right? Quite well. They can do quite well. If, if they don't become over descriptive, you know how when a lady is trying to tell you a story, right? So the actual story would be, hey, hon, I got up from, I got up this morning and I went to the store and I saw my cousin there. And so I came back home. That was a nice old meeting. I'd be the whole story, but that's not the way they tell it. They say, Hey hon, guess what? But before I tell you that, hon, you know, when I got up and I put my left foot on the floor, right? That's when I found this shoe I'd been looking for all my life. And then, and then you'll say, well, wait a minute, where are you going with this? Well, wait a minute. They'll say, I have to tell you the other stuff first. They don't make good programmers. Because they, they have to tell you every single detail that they find important or fascinating and communicate that. They don't make good programmers. Because the computer will start, you know, it'll lock up on them every single time. Because they tried to tell it too much. Irrelevant information. Right? So they get these checksum errors or something like that, over descriptive. Then they get irritated and they give up. And sure enough, those people, now listen, this is funny. People who give stories like that, who add up all these little details, they do not like technology. Isn't that funny? People who make good programmers are quite direct. They're bottom line people. So you can ask a person who's a programmer and you can say, well, you know, how much money do you have? They'll say three cents, just like that. You ask a person who's not a programmer, how much money do you have? And they'll look at you and they'll say, well, why do you want to know that? Well, this, that, and the other, right? Because they're not direct, of course. They like to engage. Create is very direct. Do you know that? It is extremely direct with no embellishments. It is flawless. And it executes every single day. We are the element in creation that gives it the flavor it has. We create that flavor. In the absence of flavor, what do we do? We spruce up things. For example, being saved. You know, when I was young, I used to hear people say, you, you should get saved. 
you need to get saved. And I'm going to ask myself in the head now, how would you tell a person? How can, how do I know what this, I know what this is. I know you need it, but why is no one describing it? I honestly did. I said, there's all these people are speaking, but they're not telling me how to do it. Then they say, well, you got to get saved like this. You got to believe in Jesus Christ and you have to say you're sorry for your sins and you're saved. And that wasn't enough for me. I said, that's not going to work either. They're not describing anything. You know what? The truth be told, the only time I found out the full process of how to be saved is when I read the word myself because nobody else told me. It is this version they had that everybody has heard, and I found it empty. Nowadays, a person will tell you, oh, I already know that. You got to be saved. I already know that stuff. How can anybody ever say that? When being saved is the whole point of God's word. When being saved is the whole point of creation. When being saved is the whole point of all the elements of creation. So you may not know this, but everything you see in space was created for your process. Now, swallow that one for a minute. The sun, the galaxies, everything out there was created for your process. Everything, the bugs, the fish, the animals, everything created for your process. But Satan, listen, the Lord tells us this very clearly. In, in fact, I might read that here shortly, but he tells us that very clearly. Here's the problem. Though. The problem is, the problem is, there are other elements in the earth, right? They do not like your father. They do not like my father in heaven. In fact, what did Jesus say? What did the Lord say about their love for the world? Hmm? Do you guys remember what Jesus said about the world? I remember him saying, he said, if the world hates you, he, he said, then no one hated me before it hated you. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, the world's going to hate you. That's what Jesus said. The world's not going to like you because Jesus chose you. That's what he said. He said that. Matter of fact, that's John 15, what, 18 through 20, I believe. Correct me later if I'm wrong about that, but I think it's somewhere near there. He speaks about that. He speaks very plainly. He speaks a monumental phrase. For some reason, people don't like to hear it. They don't like to hear it. Why don't they like to hear that? Why? Is that not the heart? Heart. Let me ask you guys something. Let me ask you, just, for, just because we're talking about, you know, people talk about logical things. We're talking about spiritual things. What is the number one commandment of Jesus? Can somebody tell me that? Anybody? Can anybody tell me what the number one command of Jesus is? Anybody? Somebody says love, but w what is it? What is it? Anybody? Jesus said in John 15, he said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. He said, these things I have spoken unto you that, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. He said, this is my commandment. What did he say? He said that in John 15, 12. He said, this is my commandment. Uh-oh. He said, this is my commandment. You ready? That you love one another as I have loved you. Then he described it. Oh, here it comes. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, he said. If you do whatsoever I command you. He said, you're my friends if. Here's a condition. If you do whatsoever I command you. That's very direct, isn't it? Jesus was so incredibly direct. Do you know how many times I've heard this preached? And it was not direct. It was full of worldly flavor. They decrease the love aspect or totally define it some weird way to excuse them to hate people in the world to cover up for this foolish paradigm that people suffer from now, right? You know, because the enemy wants you to have a target. And so they, if, if you support the world in any way, you have to also teach people to have a target. You do. Just telling you that. Once we mature, we get rid of that. That's a common element with everybody on this earth, except for some. I can honestly tell you, I think it was born against, 
I was born against those things that fight against love. I, th I think I was. There is no case in my life, no case in my life, that anybody can ever accuse me of hating them. There's no case in my life that that would ever happen. There's no case, there's no person in my life that could ever say, Mike, you disrespected me. Do you know that? Not that odd. That's pretty odd, right? That means I ate all sorts of crow. That's what it means. But Jesus said, no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. What does that mean to you guys? All this is going full circle. What does that mean to you guys? He was, that's quite blunt, right? That's very direct. You can't describe that a thousand different ways. That's very direct. What does that mean? That you lay down your life for your friends? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? You, know, you, um, you just die for someone? Because if it means that, that is so easy. Do you know how easy it is to die for someone? Huh? Do you know how easy that is? That is so easy. But every time Jesus mentioned that word die, it was a prefix to his conversation. See, sometimes when he mentioned that word die, die meant, especially in this case, to lay down your life for your friends. That term, lay down your life. Many people associate that with death. So when I said, how do you die for your friends? That's not what he was saying, was it? He said, lay down your life. Oops, now that's hard. Most people say, hey, you die for your friends. No greater love than that. Well, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Laying down your life is not easy. It, it is an act of love. It can only be done by way of love. Do you know that? It cannot be done any other way. So let me explain that to you. Suppose I'm conversating with someone. They start to argue about a scripture. They get a little smirky with it, something like that, right? Now, suppose I know I'm right, and the person I'm talking to is a, he indeed is a friend. In that conversation, we already know that if you continue on that track of arguments and one win over against the other, that's uh, no good. What's it going to prove? Nothing. You know, I've heard so many people say, well, I had to tell them the right thing. Sure you did. No, you wanted them to know, and you wanted to stick up for yourself to the last moment because you thought you were right. And any time a person thinks they're right, for the most part, they think they have a right to say that they're right. Correct? I hear that a lot these days. We have rights. I have a right to do this and a right to do that. Well, then do this and that. Stop telling everybody you have a right to do it and do it. So in an argument like that, suppose you're really right. You know you're right. And you, your friend needs to know the right way. But for some reason, they believe in a corrupted way. How would you lay yourself down? How would you lay your life down for that friend in that matter? How would you do that? Well, to lay your life down is to cease, isn't it? When you lay your life down, that means you stop your way of doing things. You have abruptly halted your way of doing things. Because see, when you die, you abruptly halt your way of doing anything. Your way of breathing, seeing, and everything else, you're gone. Your way never interrupts anybody else. So when you lay down your life for someone else, aren't you surrendering your lifestyle, your way of living, your way of communication, your way of everything for the sake of somebody else? Can you see it? That's pretty, that's not so easy to do, is it? Huh? And you can only do that when you truly do love someone, which is the amazing part. Somebody says silence. Nope, silence is not laying your life down for somebody else. It isn't. I, it, it'd be nice if it was, but that's not the deal. No, when somebody thinks they're right on scripture, I do it all the time, right? I engage people. I will not exercise my way over them. When you love someone, right, you want them to have the rightful answer. Now, listen, I never assume. I can read this right to you, but I'm not assuming. I'm right about what I'm saying. I want you to have the truth. Have you noticed something about me? I want people to have the truth so much, it must never come from me. I want you to have my truth. I want you to have the truth. So what do I do? I point you to a direction, don't I? Hmm? I may say something that captures your attention. You'll say, hey, let me go look at that. I, I, didn't, I never saw that before. Let me go find it. What do you do? You go back to the word of God. I don't point you to me. I don't want you coming to me. 
Why would I do that? Because, listen, if I care about you and you're broken, I'm going to take you to the one who can fix everything. That means you cannot come to me. I'm going to show you where he is. Because if you find out where he is, he's the one that can truly fix everything about you. He can. See, I know when you know that, you don't want people coming to you. You don't want that. You want people going to the source, to Christ. So out of love, there have been lots of times I have surrendered many things so a person can actually find Christ. See, all too often, we are in the way. We are. And in that act of love, you can surrender lots of things so that that person can find out who Christ is. Somebody had that uh, that conversation about drinking a while back, and they said, well, drinking is a sin, right? Well, I don't believe that. I believe the word of God, I do. The Bible says, you know, you're not to drink to the point of drunkenness. You're supposed to be sober of mind. You're not supposed to indulge in strong drink and all that stuff, true. But it's another fact that wine is good for you. But guess what? I do not drink, and I will not touch any type of alcohol of any type. Do you know why? Anybody know why? Is is it because I don't like wine? No, that's not it. I've had wine before. I've had champagne before. I've had it, right? Some of this stuff is good. Never touch it, though. That was my decision. When I was a young one, it remains my decision today. Do you know why? There it is, Lou Daddy. I don't want others to stumble. See, if somebody sees me drinking wine, right? And I care about that person. And the Bible says we have to abstain from all appearances of evil. That's an unselfish thing, which means there's nothing wrong with wine. But I'm not going to cause a little one to slip, to see me drinking wine. And I cannot go through all the principles dealing with that drinking of wine. That'll never happen. Not going to do it. Hmm? A lot of people do lots of things. And they say, I'm doing it anyway. There's nothing wrong with it. They don't like it. They can just go somewhere else. That's not laying down your life for your friends. That's not what that is. Laying down your life for your friends is when you can truthfully take something that could be harmless and not do it for the sake of somebody else. There's another term for that. It's called selfless service. Selfless service. You're not the benefactor of your labor. It's very easy, right? Very direct. Now, why is that not well understood these days? Because we're talking about code, right? We're talking about the inability of a lot of people, but hear me carefully on this, to stick with programming because they want the computer to do what they want the computer to do. And when an error comes up, they get irritated. Well, this computer is just not, it's not doing what I want it to do. I've heard people say, well, this, you know, they were just writing a simple document. And you know what one person said? They said, I can't believe... You have to start up Microsoft Word with the mouse. It shouldn't be that way. That's what this person said. So clearly, they do not like the standards. They can't submit themselves to things. And when people make utterances like that, they're not very good at submitting, period. Unless, unless, unless they have some sort of advantage by doing it. But when it comes to submitting themselves to somebody else's authority where they gain nothing, they don't want to do it. They want to be right about everything. Those people are the ones who don't like technology. And it's very simple. It's because they're unwilling to bend in their own personal ways. I used to hear people say, you know, well, I'm outspoken. Somebody said that in COT one time and they were proud. And I said, please, don't, don't say that. That's horrible. Well, what do you mean it's horrible? See, because Satan is pretty cruel in his tricks. So here's how it works. You guys come up in life and you suppress your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions about things. Somebody in your family or somebody close to you has told you to shut up one too many times. And when they did this, nobody listened to a word you have to say, right? There were times in your life when you were excited about something. You couldn't share it with a soul. Do you know that's that's very unhealthy mentally? There were times in your life when you couldn't share anything because somebody would always tell you that your ideas are garbage. Go sit down. We don't want to hear it. And they would gladly listen to somebody else with something dumber. Right? Wouldn't they? Right? Run in your face. So they wouldn't listen to you, but they would listen to Uncle Fester. Right? That's what they would do. And so when you grow up, that becomes an issue. When you come into the body of Christ, 
and you're freed and you find out about salvation, all of a sudden you, you find out you belong to a bigger family. But in that bigger family, there's a mistake that's made because of no counseling. Here it is. A lot of people are bruised when they come into the body of Christ. There's no secret about that. Here's the problem. When you come into the body of Christ, into your new family, right? All too often, you don't want it to be like your old family. Your old family didn't want to hear a word you had to say. So in your new family, you have to give a daily resume to everybody to qualify yourself behind everything you say so that they know you know what you're talking about because you don't want your new family telling you to go be quiet. So it's this unspoken thing that rises up. And when somebody says something or insinuates that you're wrong, offense comes in. Why? Because of your old family. That's why. So in other words, you're letting the pain from the old family ruin your new family. Pain, the wounds from your old family is causing you potentially to inflict damage on, with, or to your new family. Because nobody ever told, nobody tells people enough, hey, that quirky idea you had, that was pretty awesome. Continue to be the way you are. See, not a lot of people will tell you you're appreciated the way you are right now. You're appreciated. Your quirkiness, if you stutter, you stutter. If you can't pronounce something, you can't pronounce it. If you can't spell, you can't spell. If you can't spell, good for you. Whatever the deal is, you're fully accepted. Nobody tells people that enough. You know what they always do? They always like to correct the other person, but why? I'll tell you why. Because they were hurt in their other families. And when you're hurt in your other families, you want to be accepted in your new family. Because when you come to Christ, you say, wow, there are others like this. There, there's, there, there's a lot of people who believe in Christ. I have a family, a real family. Now I got to show them who I am. I got to show them my worth. No, you don't. You're fully accepted for who you are. And because the power of the Holy Spirit is real, your qualifications are already known. You need not prove a thing. Just be 100% yourself and continue to grow with Christ. And they don't know that. Who you are is the beautiful person. Not who you're trying to be, who you are. The same person that those people in the world hated, wanted you to change, told you to put away, locked him up and threw away the key, that same person is the adorable person. That is the person of wealth. That is the person the body of Christ needs. That's why the world wanted you to suppress everything about yourself. That's why you have religious people around you. I, I know certain people who have been around religious people so much. They look for religious people. A person will say something, oh, that person sounds religious. What are you doing? I'm looking for people who have these ways because they'll come in and just ruin everything because it's, I know it's here somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it's here. Stop looking for it. Here's the opposite. I can see a religious person. They start talking their religious rhetoric. Then I hear them say one statement. Join with the liberty of Christ and not lock on to it. And I'll take that one thing they said. Say, now you just said something right there. That was a blessing. I'll leave the rest of the stuff alone. I tend to see the good in a person. And I'll edify that good. Why? Because I understand we're all wounded. I do. Some, they let those wounds fester. They guard those wounds. If you have a sore on your arm, say you get cut. You let that cut go for a week, it's going to be infected. It may not be life-threatening, but as soon as anything touches it, it's going to be tender, right? And so what do you end up doing? When somebody gets close to that tender sore, what do you do? You start shielding it. You protect it with everything that you are because you know if anybody touches it, it's going to hurt, correct? That's how people have come into the body of Christ. Anybody ever have a sore that was no big deal, but it was tender after about a week or so? And you hit it on something, you're like, what in the world is that? Anybody ever do that? It gets tender after about a week. That means it's infected. And so the slightest touch can make it hurt real bad. It could be the tiniest, tiniest little scrape. And you're wondering why in the world that thing hurt so much. It's infected. Go get some Bactine. Take care of it. People come into the body of Christ like that. And when we come in wounded, we're shield, we're guarding everything. Guarding everything. And when we're guarding everything, we don't take everything in. We're very defensive. We are. We're just like that. And so in our being like that, we find ourselves incomplete. Why? 
We won't open up because we'll always say, I can't open up. Well, why not? Because I can't. Because I got hurt last time. You did. By who? By those people over there. We're not the people over there. We're the people over here. Who did you open up to? The people. Well, stop opening up to people and open up to your Lord. I just told you something. You missed it. We talked about programming. We talked about everything. Everything is for you. And I just said something. You can put an emotion right away. When you're guarding that tender spot and you want no one to touch it, you'll, all, you'll often tell people why you guard it after a while. You'll say those other people did that. Those people. What people? People I just came from, they did it. Well, guess what? We're not those people. By the way, by the way, if somebody's that close to a wound, what are you doing looking for stuff in other people? Oops, there it is. There it is. Do you know how many times people come into the body of Christ to find other people? They love the Lord, yes. They're looking for people to replace the people they lost. I have a different way. I have a method, you could say. Listen, because people can't hurt me, and it's so funny, they just can't do it. There's a reason for that. I get backstabbed all the time. Nobody ever knows it. Why? There's no effect to it. Why? I've had lots of wounds. And not one of you can touch it. Why? Why? Why not? Why is it not tender to people? Because I'm not looking to people to repair anything about me. I'm looking to the Lord. Now listen to the process. When I look to Christ, I entrust him with things. But I also disclose to him all things. See, many of you, you'll say, well, I need somebody to talk to. That's what I never do. Don't fall for that. If the world teaches that one. Well, Sonny, you got to have someone you have to talk to. Now, who told everybody that one? Somebody explain that to me. Show me that biblical principle, please. Where is that at? Why does the world give advice like that? And we take it so willingly and add it to our knowledge and spew the same vomit. Well, you got to have somebody you got to talk to that got me in so much trouble. Are you kidding? No. The Lord told me I can talk to him. That's precisely what I do. See, because whoever you talk to and confide in, that's who you're looking for something from. Do you hear me? You're going to be looking to that person for something. You're going to need some type of return. I found out something. People cannot give, they can't return to me what I'm looking for. Not directly. They can't do that. God can orchestrate it, but I, can't, I cannot look to a person, wrap them up in chains, and every day look them in the eye and say, you got what I want back from you? No, I can't do that. You don't just say it like that. It's subconscious or something, right? But you guys get the gist of it. Now, when you open up yourself to Christ, when you talk to Christ, just like you would talk to me or somebody else, right? Because I do not go to the Lord and say, thou greatest of all who was great. I don't do that. I'm not it. I, I don't talk like that normally. Is it that people start talking the old English? Anyway, I addressed the Lord with my honesty. He taught me to do that in a very uh, corrective way. There was there were some times I said some big phony prayers. You know that they sounded beautiful, but they were as phony as baloney as real meat. They were phony. They were phony. You know a, a real prayer is when you're saying, "Lord, I, I need your help," and you got a tear coming out your eye. And you're fidgeting with your fingers because you're in trouble. And you don't know what to do and your heart is palpitating. And you say, Lord, please help me. And that's a real prayer. That's a real one. That's a real one right there. Yes, sir, that is. If I can orchestrate a prayer and say the perfect words, that's done for others' ears. When you address the Most High, He heard you before you ever spoke a thing. So, the world has taught us, listen, to to compose our prayers, listen to me carefully, and to go with it, right? But how many times have you approached Christ with a composed prayer and did not disclose to him the absolute issues of your life, only to focus on the one thing that seemed common to all? You get you got people out there that are they're, they're praying about things, Lord, help me with this. But they didn't say, Lord, I'm fully rejecting who you made me to be. I got a problem with that. I need help with that. They didn't say that. That's what they need to say. Wouldn't you think? There are people 
who cannot stand to look upon other races. You know what they say? They say, ah, those type people repulse me. Well, why? I don't know why. Wouldn't that be a prayer? Wouldn't you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem. These people, when I look at them, I start, I don't just don't like them. They look dirty to me. Help me. That'd be a true prayer. But that's not how people pray, is it? In other words, they keep the major problems. They start talking about the obvious thing. Look at the world. Look at the world. Matter of fact, look at the church that exists today. Look how many denominations are within the realm of Christianity. And show me the unity. We continue to look over the brokenness, composing some other prayer. And why? Because that's what somebody else said you should do. Why do we trust a person so blindly when we cannot trust Yahshua HaMashiach blindly? Why is it that we can read John John's book and believe every word and even employ the methods John John gives us, but we can't read the Bible and believe every single word and employ what they have given us? Why is it that we have access to the words of Jesus Christ, but won't employ them all? Why do we need any additional knowledge when we cannot receive the knowledge put before us? Because, listen, your old family, remember them? The old people in your life that did not accept you because of your quirkiness, because of your over-kindness, because of the ways that weren't conducive of their lifestyle. They condemned who you were and locked you up. They made you hide your true identity in order to protect yourself. It's almost like people said, I, I can never let my true self come forward. Even right now, there are many of you right now hiding who you really are. I'm not talking about not showing your face. Forget about that nonsense. I'm saying you're not being who God made you to be yet because you do not trust everybody like that. You won't open up because of trust issues. You won't authentically become who you really are because you feel people are going to trample it underfoot. Some of you are incredibly kind, but guess what? Somebody told you, you were naive. So you took your kindness that God put in you and you covered it over. You locked it away. And you said that I can't ever show this. This can only, only get me wounded. See? And so by locking yourselves away, guess what? Do you really expect to become what the Lord has put in you to become? Let me tell you what I did. I was someone else. And I thought I had to be a specific individual for the sake of many people. I threw all that nonsense away. All of it. I threw all of it away. I'm kind too. I am. I'm kind. Quirky. Nerdy. Sometimes quite bold. Up front. In your face. Sometimes shy. But one thing is for sure. I'm no good at being anybody but me. And I refuse to hide. Whom the Lord is raising in me. There was a time I would not talk to anybody about the word of God like I'm doing with you. Do you know that? There were times I could see so much about people. Truth be told, you may not believe it. I stay away from a lot of human contact. I do. I know it sounds weird, but I stay away from people a lot. Do you know why? Because it was perceived when I'm around people. Like a thousand voices happening at one time in the volumes all the way up. Like emotions are pulled out from this side, that side, and every side. Now, when I was young, right, people would say, start. Get rid of that. I was very sensitive. Very sensitive. And the ironic part is, it was normally always right on the money. I threw that away. Some of you did the same thing. You, you threw that away. You can't do that stuff. Right? Do you know how many times I felt distress coming from a person and did nothing? Do you know how many times I had the solution to a person's problem? I could see it and did nothing to help them. Do you know how many times that happened? Lots. One day, reading in the Bible, that's when the stories came alive. It's almost like the Lord said, what are you doing? There's a story in the Bible of a person who they locked away. We did the same thing. That's the story of us. They locked this person away. The person God sent here, they locked away. But as it turns out, it's the person that was locked away, the one who God called, that's the one 
who delivers everybody else. That's the one utilized for everybody else. In my case, it's my quirkiness that really helps people. The very thing people said I should not have is the very thing that has a pretty strong weapon against darkness itself. It's the very thing. You know that compassion that you have? When everybody else turned away from someone, you saw that someone like it was in slow motion, but then you turned away with the group. You chose to be like the group and ignored who God made you to be. The one who God made you to be, you would have went right over to the person who was being laughed at. You would have comforted the person they were talking about, making fun of, laughing at, doing whatever they were doing. You were. But to hide yourself in the world to survive, what did you do? You put away the person God made you to be, and you adopted what you were never meant to be. Now that you get older, right, you have developed that person that just came out of nowhere, but I'm telling you now, the Lord is coming back for who he made you to be. He will not come back for a stranger. No. He knows exactly who he's coming back for. He is not coming back for our invented personalities. Not I decided I'm going to be who I am. I decided that. That's when the losses happened. You kidding me? But then I compared. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What am I thinking about losses for? I started thinking about all my losses by becoming this figure in the world, living up to the expectations of so many different people. I lost myself in that stuff. Everything in that stuff. How could I lose anything else? Hmm? Be that simple person the Father put here on this earth. That's who you really are, not the person you invented. He knows who he sent, and it is not the people we invented. He knows why you invented that character. Truth be told, you were surviving. You were surviving. But the person God put here on this earth, that's who all the gifts are for, that person. Not for the created invention of us, but for the person God put here. You know that emptiness? That disconnect you feel sometimes? Think about who you have built versus who God sent here in the first place. Think about that contrast. Okay, Robin says break out. Listen, I'm going to take a break. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at the Council of Time with this unscheduled talk. I'll be right back. Nobody left? Okay, everybody stayed. I guess I'll go ahead with it. All right, guys, everybody stayed. Listen, I guess you're wondering, why is Mike saying all this about getting back to who God made us to be. Since I'm quirky already, right? You guys are going to see a large military police response. Kind of militant. A response. A big response. You guys remember Florida? You remember all those police that showed up at the mall because of the children? You guys are going to see a pretty big response. Very similar to that. Except twice as many. Three times as many people, as many officers involved, and a whole lot more people go have their own narrative, of course. But Florida was key event. Our father did not make a mistake who he has sent here for this time. There is no force that will ever overwhelm a believer in Christ. If you have gone through anything that was to strengthen you, to develop you, to bring your character to the forefront, to grow you. There's been a long period of people going through things and then being able to observe what they've been through. Their time was always coming of employment where you would have to employ those things you know of the Lord. Stand on your foundation. And we're not talking about a major trying of all humanity. No, no, no. But events, yes. Things that people are not used to, they will go through. When this gathering takes place, when you guys hear about this, it'll seem similar to, it'll be like Florida's situation. Now, it may be by appearances. It may seem like something different. They can name it anything they want, but you'll get the gist of it. Things are going to go, you know how people do when they get a hold of things like this. Right? When things like this happen, they all of a sudden become the experts on it. This will be the first of a few. Then all of a sudden, it's not going to stop. Many will be wore down because they won't be able to figure out the nature of the issue. 
and it will keep happening. And all the while, you will notice the degradation of morality, increase in violence, irritation, aggravation, and foulness dripping out of everybody's mouth. Just remember, the Lord didn't make a mistake choosing you to be here at this time. There are others out there. Think of them as being you a long time ago, and they're out there in the world. They are. The only way we can be effective in this time is by way of our faith. That means we're either going to have it for real or we're going to fold. Many will give in because they'll find themselves powerless. But those who give in, listen, because do, do you guys think that Jesus tells the truth? I do. So when people stand before him and he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Do you think that's going to be a lie? I do not. If he never knew them, then they never were your brothers and your sisters. Now that's invisible right now. And that will be uncovered at the end. It's not uncovered right now. That's why we stand on that principle. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Spiritual weakness and high places. Evil. People, the person, should never be a target of you. You've been authorized and in fact empowered against the heavy duty things that will come that people will seem to have no power over. But you will. And you will know that. The world's not going to have an answer. And you know what happens when something of a different nature encounters something of a somewhat uh, diminished nature? You know what happens? The one with a diminished nature perceives the power of the others who come and they seem to bow to them. They bend to them. With the world, when they cannot defeat something, they bow to it. They appoint it. They deify it. But from the beginning, somehow, those of you who are born of God, as it states in the Gospel of John chapter 1, somehow you knew of the others. I'll call them. Somehow you knew of those additional elements. See, the Lord had you in a position where you did not have a normal time all the time. You had your moments. You had your insights. You had the wacky moments when you were small when it sounded like you heard chatter. Anybody ever hear people when you were about possibly 11, 9, I say 9 to 12, and you heard people talking real fast, like real fast, and then it would go away? Anybody ever do that? Huh? Like real fast chatter, and it would go away. You really didn't, you didn't, you couldn't do anything. You would hear it, and you know, the moment will come on, then it's gone. Anybody ever do that? Many of you were born insightful. You have hit and misses in your life, but the truth is, you knew things. Some things did not surprise you. But when you were young, you had a deep sadness inside. You remember that? You remember how you did not like the world. You thought it was too cruel. It was a loss of love in this world. You saw it leaving, and you couldn't do anything about it. It forced you to become a survivor. Some of you probably got a multitude of fights over this because you had to become a survivor. But the truth is, you noticed love was dying in this world. You saw it, you knew it. And you could not communicate it. You couldn't even make sense of it. But you would see it, perceive it. And then you were attracted to certain subjects. Nobody initiated these subjects with you. You were drawn to them, weren't you? You know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about the Bible. Nope, we're not talking about the Bible. You were, see, people can hide this all day. They, they can try and hide it. I come on, I know better. People were drawn to certain subjects. That was when you were real young. Some of you, possibly, you heard something on the radio or saw something on television, and it really drew your attention. And you were immersed in it. And you had a different imagination. As you grew, right, you tried to ignore it, didn't you? You tried, but every time that subject, a documentary, or something kicked in, you would find it until many of you had certain moments in your life when you were ready. How many here had dreams of black and white? No color, just black and white. How many? And it was weird because you really can't even quite call it a dream now, can you? But it was black and white. 
just black and white. How many of you remember the moments you're laying in bed and something in you knew? You knew something, like something was coming. You said, ah, it's coming. It's going to happen again. You didn't know what was going to happen again. You just said to yourself, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen. And you knew it. You never communicated that to anybody. Probably people don't know that of you to this very day. But those are no accidents. They're no accidents. Your father desires you to be in truth, not lying, fantasy, imagination, embellished stories, but the real deal. Can't you see you've been spoon-fed something over time? Why? Because you live in this time. This is not some normal time. There is something very close to you, very close to all of us. Now listen, the Bible says that during these times, people are going to have a rough time hanging on to life because of what they see. I've seen people burn out and blow up. When they saw certain things, that, that most people who deny things, the reason they deny them is they really do not want to deal with that subject. They do not. If they deny it violently, then they have knowledge of it. If they passively deny it because they don't believe it, they're clueless. But if they become violent and deny it, they want nothing to do with it. It scares them. So what do you think is going to happen? When these spiritual things start happening, I'm going to call them spiritual. I'm going to call them what they are. When these spiritual things begin to happen all over the place, what do you think the average person is going to do? Somebody said, I, I never feel it anymore. Yeah, for some of you, it's almost like 2013 through 2015, something left. It left, didn't it? Left you alone. Everything left. Anybody have that where everything just shut down all of a sudden? It just left. Your life was a bit disrupted, wasn't it? Where they, where, what happened? Huh? What happened? Everything is like normal now. What happened? My life has not been normal. What, what turned off? What shut off? Some of you are like that. If more and more people would tell the truth, I'm talking about believers. My goodness, we could really get some ground going. We could really go into the word then. For the most part, there's a, people are still almost in a programmed mode to ignore the truthful things that happened. But I'm telling you now, the Lord made you a bit differently and a lot bolder. He did not make you to go run away. He didn't make you to duck your head in the sand. You may be timid. You may be. You may not perceive yourself as a warrior, but the Lord has preserved you. He preserved you. He preserved you for this time. So guess what? That, that when you were intimidated, when you had these things come over you in the presence of violence, how many had a freeze come over them in the presence of hostilities or violence? And you didn't quite understand it. I mean, it's almost like you said, wait a minute, I could take these people, but what is this? Like something else was causing you not to get into certain things. You couldn't make sense of it. You've been preserved. See, because lots of people read prophecy. They read about demons. They read about angels. They read about the father. They read about the son. They read about the extraordinary events, but they don't believe them. But guess what? They will begin to open up. They will increase in frequency. They're going to throw people off. You got to get yourselves ready for a lot of people making new religions. You got to get yourselves ready for a lot of Christians. They're going to start throwing stuff into the Bible and believe a totally different way than what the Lord has put in all of you. That's why collectively, right? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together in the word of God because what normally happens historically when civilizations right before they fall these weird religions come in and people start gravitating towards these weird religions why because you have Christians out there right now that do not believe in miracles and if a miracle would happen they still can't perceive it they can't accept it you say I can't deal with it then somebody comes along and explains it a different way. They develop cults. They're going to utilize these extraordinary events to have people believe in a bunch of nonsense. Did you ever notice in Revelation that most of the people in Revelation, they blaspheme the Father for the things that were happening? They blaspheme those that live in the heavens? Well, my question to you is, why would they blaspheme the Father for these events that are happening on earth? I'll tell you why. Because they knew they were coming from the Father. See, if you, if you ask the average person where are all these storms coming from, they're going to have a scientific answer. They're not going to say, well, God's doing this. They're not going to be angry at God for doing that. 
those who believed, something is soon to happen. Many of those who believe now will not believe then. They won't. They won't. Those are the ones. Those are the ones that will blame God. They will mock him. Cast his name down. They'll put everything on him and say he's doing this and they still will not yield nor repent because they once knew him. It's kind of like a person who goes to church and they follow the Lord and then something happens. They become an atheist. They say, why are you an atheist? Now, why would a loving God take my wife away? That's why I'm an atheist. All of them have stories like that. They're hurt. They're deeply hurt. And so they hate God. Many of you. I've been through moments in your life where you were not happy with the Father. You still believed, and you were angry. You were bold and silly enough to be angry at the living God, like you had lost your mind. You did. So think about people of whom Christ did not call back. Hmm? Who would you have become if that hatred would have continued to stir? If the Lord would have left you alone, not educated you to the truth, and let you begin to build upon whatever you were starting to believe. If he didn't call you back home, you would have been lost in the sauce with a lot of hatred toward the heavens. You got to get yourselves ready for that. When people do not get their way, when their paradigm does not come true, when they get violent and angry, that's when you find out who they are. Listen to me. Please listen to me. You don't know if a person is good or evil until, until you see that person and things are not going their way, then you find out who they are. If somebody truly belongs to the living God, and things are not going their way, they do not lash out at everybody. They don't do that. No, they inquire of the Lord. They repent. They refine their lives. They do a lot, but they do not lash out at everybody else. Those who become violent and others, sure they're hurt. But it's in your pain and in your hurt and in your distress. That's when you convey who you truly are. Thank God that happened to you early in life. That you were able to go and say, Lord, help me with this person. That's in me. Get these ways away from me. But I tell you, now you're going to see men revel in their own violence. And they'll call that violence purity. They'll justify it. Now is that time. You'll begin to see who is who, and you will not like it. The Lord did not make a mistake putting you in this time. He did not. Somebody says, Mike, do you know something about the issue with split personalities from birth on all parts of yourself? Sure I do. I know the world uses that term split personality. I understand what they're trying to say. But you see, they're, they're, they're diagnosing a behavioral pattern absent the spirit. In so doing, they err in their interpretation of what's actually happening to the person. The Father sent us here to be delivered, to be fully delivered. In order to do that, all of us had to be born in bondage. All of us did. All of us were born into a world full of sin, into darkness. Now, in that darkness, many things were attached to us. They were. Many things were in the families we were born from. All of us went through this. As we over, listen to me, as we overcome these things, that's when we become strong. And it just so happens, hear me, the very thing you have to overcome is the very thing you are to excel in. So, for example, suppose a person is born into a family full of abuse. Now, that person, when they overcome the abuse, it just so happens. God called them to intercede in the lives of all those who are abused. So, of course, they were going to be born into abuse. And as they are delivered from the wounds, and as they are delivered from that stigma, and as they begin to acquaint themselves with the living God and start seeing the actual spirit, they become a weapon against darkness that darkness can no longer stop. As it turns out, that's why Jesus had to be tried, didn't he? Everything must be tried. Everything that is of value is going to be tried by the fire. And your life is that fire. So people are born with many things. And sometimes in your family line, there are generational curses that marked you. But guess what? You're sent here to overcome everything. Do you hear me? Everything. So these problems and these issues that people face and have and are trying to get over. That's why we continue and encourage to continue. Because when you overcome that thing. 
then you have overcome. You can overcome everything else in life. If you don't overcome that one thing, you didn't overcome anything. It's kind of like that person you can't get rid of in your life. The person that keeps coming back, the person you prayed that the Lord would take away out of your way, that you'd never see that person again. And yet they continue to pop up in your life. And you're saying, well, what in the world? It just so happens that is the person you find it very difficult to forgive. That is the person that can cause you to curse. That is the person that can cause you to have a fit of carnality. And then you have to go back after this person, you know, is outside of your proximity. You say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive, keep that person away from me because they're causing me to lose my footing every time they come around. The Lord is telling you, he's showing you something. Did you hear what I just said? People will say that too. That person is causing me to lose my footing when they come around. Well, let me communicate this to you. If that person can cause you to backslide, if that person can cause you to sin, you can't even face Satan. Can you? If a person can cause you to go against Yahshua HaMashiach, you have no chance against the devil. Do you hear me? So when you overcome that person and can maintain who you are in Christ, then you have overcome all darkness. That person is a gauge in your life. Oh, and guess what else? There's always the icing on the cake. That same person that keeps coming around that seems like they know exactly what to say to get you going. They know exactly what to do to get you out of sorts. That same person. Have you ever noticed they don't listen to anybody? Have you noticed that? They don't let everybody has told you they don't listen to anybody. Do you know why? Because you're the one appointed to speak to them. If you don't overcome that person, who you're in trouble. But if you do, through you, they will glorify Christ. You see, that goes all these things we suffer with. They're not mistakes. They are not mishaps. They are critical. They can only be overcome by the word of God. You should know that by now. They can't be overcome any other way. Hmm? You know, and that makes us real. Because to overcome it, you've got to be real. To get through it, you've got to be real. You've tried. People have tried every alternative and everything has failed we're being saved delivered here remember that we're being saved and delivered all right folks i want to tell you guys that for everybody who's stuck around oh yeah when it does take place right don't don't please don't don't look at me like i'm someone special don't do that you guys who have been here at COT for a long time, you already know not to do that. Don't do that. But we'll take it a step further. Okay? And a step further. And a step further. There's a lot of work to be done here. Only in truth can that work be done. I can tell you this. If you listen to the world and believe what they say, well, you'll even forget we had this discussion. Seek the Lord when it happens. Have an understanding that we are in the end times. Don't make, don't add to it. Don't make up anything. If you don't understand it, don't communicate it to, any, don't communicate it to anybody else. When it takes place, there'll be much more to say. Get ready for it. Because a lot of people are not going to be ready for it. And you'll see what happens when things really catch people off guard. But most importantly, you're not a mistake nor a mishap. You're highly purposed to be here. Our Father is going to help clarify why you're here. That's why these years of demonstration had to come. They had to come. Because if these years of demonstration did not come, people will continue to tell you what is favorable to them. The Lord has already answered many of your questions. All you have to do is revisit what's been happening in your life to see the truth of the whole thing. Do you know that? Somebody said, Mike, considering what you said, what you do when it's like someone literally goes out of their way to give you a hard time of keeping your distance isn't necessarily the answer. Yeah. Well, maybe a confrontation. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you guys something. If a person was possessed and came to you harassing you, what's your defense? What is your defense? Anybody know? What's your defense? You know what? Demonic entities influence people's minds. That's why the Bible says, take captive of your thought. They're quite active here on the earth. Quite active. They cause anybody in a moment of weakness to do a myriad of things always against you. So how do you fight that? 
You find darkness with love itself. How do you do that with a person you don't even know? Be reminded they're a human being and something is using them. Always look and be reminded that the Lord gave them life too. You want to really get rid of a dark entity? Realize the Father's work in a person. Realize that. Because when you realize God made them too, God gave them life too, that they're breathing because they're in an era of grace and mercy, you're already defeating the darkness within that person. Demons want you to act outside of grace and mercy. I'll say it one more time. Demons want you to act outside of grace and mercy. Never forget that. There will come a time. There will come a time for grace and mercy. No, there's going to be something else. That's when you will be a thousand percent authoritative. But right now they want you to operate outside of grace and mercy. They know what their master is about to do. They know about their master's timing. They want you to operate outside of grace and mercy so they can commence with their sufferings upon your life. Don't fall for that. Because if they win through a vessel against you and you step outside of grace and mercy, it's not only going to be you who may lose something, but it will be the person that demonic entity is using. If you stay within grace and mercy, you defeat the evil using that person against you. See how that works? You want to fight the good fight? Walk as your Lord walked. Obey Yahshua HaMashiach. That's what you do. You don't know how to respond to somebody. Look at how Jesus responded. Start looking at him. Start walking behind him. All of you have a Bible. You have an ability to walk behind him. Just read the gospel and start seeing your Lord and Savior. Start seeing. Somebody says, so tired, Mike. Oh, did you really just say that? Who is that? God bless you. Anybody, anybody want to be untired? Did anybody here, did, if they never heard me talk about tired? Type of one if you never heard me talk about tired. What time is it? Robin's going to fire me. If you're here, you never heard me talk about people being tired at this time, right? Type of one if you never heard me talk about being tired. There's a subject. There's an audio about being tired. There's an audio. Now listen. L- listen, folks, please. Please, I don't want you to be offended. But that is a worldly term. So let me explain it shortly. And then one of the admins, they can point you to the archive. But let me share it with you. During this time, there are lots of people who believe in Christ. And they're tired. Let me share this with you. Why do we actually get tired, though? We have those who are tired. You've tried and tried and tried, haven't you? There are areas where you've tried and tried and tried. And you say to yourselves, how long, O Lord, holy and true? Isn't that true? How long, Lord? How long do I have to continue? Isn't that what we say? There was one person. I said, hey, you doing okay? They said, yes. I said, well, they started talking. I said, wait a minute. Where's your faith? They said, well, I tried having faith. Wait wait a minute. Do you hear what you just said? You tried having faith? You can't try to have faith. You either have it or you don't. You can't try. Now, let me tell you what the person communicated. This is where everything opened up. If a person ever says, I tried to have faith, I tried to have patience, that means they're not having it now. That means they put a time limit on the living God. That means they had already said it in their minds. God, you better act within my calendar range or I'm done. See, that's when people throw in the towel. When they say, I'm not waiting anymore. That's what I'm tired means on that level. Here's the other I'm tired. You ready? If I, Mike, from around the bushes, am trying to accomplish something here on this earth, and all I end up doing is enduring this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing, I'm going to be tired. Listen carefully. You get tired when your way is not working. Can I tell you something I know for real? I should be in the grave right now. I should. I should be in the grave. Do you know how many things I could be tired of? I should be in the grave. But see, I'm not doing it my way. I don't want what I think to come to pass. I don't want my method to be functional or work in anybody's life. Let me tell you something. I'm doing what is necessary to complement the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And I'm eager to see the breakthrough in your life. Huh? Lord knows I hurt every day. I shouldn't be able to walk. I shouldn't be able to speak to any of you. I should be dead in truth. I've gone through medical bouts that are impossible for anybody to have. I've had repeat issues in certain areas. But the Lord has healed me, and he continues to do so all the time. You guys know what neuropathy is? It's pretty good when you can, when you can play with instruments. What would happen if you can't feel your fingers anymore? It'd be a hindrance, right? Why play an instrument in the first place? And you can't feel your fingers. How is anybody going to play like that? Then it spreads. Stuff stops working. Right? People would be tired. I love to draw. When I broke my first paintbrush, that was an irritation. No feeling. Right? Had a soldering iron. I started smelling some uh, smell I never smelled before. I looked down, the solder and iron tip went right in my finger, and it was sizzling. I couldn't feel it. Not good. You think I stopped art? No. Think I stopped music? No. No, 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 no. No. That was a challenge. I, I never give up because I can't establish my way. I'm not here for my way. I'm here to see the Lord's way, completed in any capacity as I give assistance with his established gospel. I'm not here to accomplish what I want to accomplish. I'm here to complement what is already accomplished. And do you know what that is? The greatest gift given to humanity. Everything that encapsulates Christ and the cross. I'm here to complement the gospel. I'm here to see your breakthrough. I'm here to do everything I can physically and mentally do and spiritually do to complement the work of the Lord that's already established. I'm not here to do my own thing. Not here to make a empire, all this other stuff. So guess what? As a consequence of that, I can't get tired. I was getting tired when I was trying to do my own thing. I was getting tired when I kept doing my thing and my vision did not come to pass. That's when you get tired. How can you get tired when you're watching something in motion that is always yielding? How can anybody get tired when you start seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ take effect in somebody's life? And then it happens the same way the Lord said it would. See, I told a story one time of this person. They had walked through all sorts of obstacles and the jungles and the everything else, but they found something. And when they walked in there, they found out it was this place that was beautiful. It was a place so beautiful and it had room for everybody. This person found a paradise. And when they found that paradise, they could not keep it to themselves. You know how when you eat something good, you have to tell somebody, hey, come and taste this. You know that? When you see something extraordinary, you say, hey, 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 come and look at this. Right? That man found something extraordinary. He could not hold it to himself. And so he went back to tell everybody else, hey, I found a place. And it's room for everybody. And so that's what he did. He didn't get tired either. My point is this. If you take note of your life carefully, you will notice that when we are attempting to accomplish things or to have something done based on our understanding, we often get tired. We often get tired. When we truly understand the cause of the gospel and we only seek to complement what Jesus has already established, there's no burden in that, like you would think. But we don't get tired. We do become eager, excited. Your life has much purpose. You feel alive again because you're complimenting something very real. And because it's not about you and it's all about the other person, it opens doors in your life that you too will say are impossible doors. When we're tired, we're tired of doing it and not receiving what we thought we should have received. We're tired of not seeing the results we thought we would have by now. We're tired of doing something, and the return is not what we thought we would have, but what if you have no expectations like that? And you can't get tired. You can't do it. You'd be like a child again. Somebody who consumed too much sugar. That's how you'd be. You still have down days. You still have opposition, things of that nature. But you would not be ready to see listen if the lord said if 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 the lord came to ask me mike are you let's go let's go you're done 
I'm telling you right now, there would be, I'd be ready to go yes. But there's one issue. There's only one issue. I'd have to know that nobody else needed me. That's the only issue. Anybody know what it is to, you're really making ground with someone else, and then all of a sudden they're no longer in your life? Anybody know what that's like? You know what it's like to need someone? They're making a real difference, and then they're gone. Sometimes in life, that one person could spend just a little time and depart a gift that would last a thousand lifetimes. See, I already know this. So I'm not willing to turn my back on anybody, especially the broken. How many people do you know out there who cannot get it right? Hmm? Lots of people say, I'm ready when the Lord returns. Well, guess what? Tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And if the Lord, if your time is up, you've got to leave your kids. You're going to leave your family. You're going to leave everything behind. Do you have all things prepared? Do you? Because we're not promised tomorrow. And how many people would have people left behind who have no clue of what to do? Can everybody take care of themselves? Are you a provider? Have you made the necessary arrangements? What about those of you who truly believe and are attempting to prepare people for the onslaught of end times events? Do you have some sort of journal instruction for everybody else? You know what the truth is? We assume we're going to be here tomorrow. So in truth, many of us do not have those things ready. That's the truth. But what would happen if a person stopped living like that? And they said, okay, Lord, I know tomorrow's not promised to me. Let me get everything ready. I can, I can almost assure you with everything in me, there's no way in the world you would ever be tired. Because every day of your life, you would say, okay, let me double check. Let me double check. Make sure I have everything right. Because I will not abandon them. How many of you out there were abandoned? You were on your own. Nobody had your back. And whatever path that was made in your life, either you or the Lord did it, but you had no support in it. How many were like that? Would you leave anybody behind? If you've gone through it yourselves, would you leave anybody like that behind? Not willing to do that. A long time ago, I made my life about everybody else's life. I had become acquainted with who I was. And then I finalized that with COT. I don't live my life for me. I live as a vessel of glad usage. That's why I'm here. I'm certainly not here for me. I'm not looking for anything for me. I'm looking for you to have the victory. I'm looking for you to overcome. I'm looking for you to overcome all the darkness in your situation. I'm looking for your breakthrough. You can't get tired doing that. You can't get discouraged. You're not going to slow down. Things will come against you still. Life is often hard still because it's a very different path. But you're not going to get tired. When you do what you do for the sakes of others, you'll often find who you really are. Somebody says, what about taking medication for severe pains? Whatever you do, do out of necessity, not for coping. That's my advice to everybody who takes pain medication. Don't take your pain medication to cope socially with everybody. Take it when you need it, and you'll surprise yourselves. If you take pain medication when you need it, and you inform your Lord of your intention, say, for example, you, you don't want that anymore. You don't want a pain medication anymore. Then tell your father about that. Say, I don't want this pain medication, and you better get ready for his solution. Get ready for his solution. He can and will deliver you. But here's the truth. Listen, never pray for something when you don't want it yourself. If you like it, how can you separate from it? So you've got to come to terms with some things. When a person is addicted, all too often they like what it yields. If you're caught in that circumstance, it's okay. You've got to let your Lord know about that. I, I, I don't subscribe. You know how people say, you've got to be careful what you ask for. That's very foolish to me. In the Bible, it says we have a good father who desires to give us good gifts. He's not going to trick us in any way. Do you hear me? You don't have to be careful of what you ask for. Be forthcoming and true in what you ask for. If a two-year-old asks for an AR-15 loaded, you're going to give it to him? No, you're not. You're not. Lots of people take pain medication. Oh, and something else. Listen, when the Lord does come, his full deliverance is with him. Listen, he's the author and finisher of your faith. 
He'll finish the work he began in you. You will not save yourselves. The Lord will save you. So that when he comes, healing is with him. Do you hear me? There are certain things you cannot break in this world. When the Lord comes, healing is with him. And yes, that means when it's your time to go, right? Say, for example, somebody goes tonight and you belong to Christ. You're going to be whole with him. Remember what he told that thief. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Take comfort in that statement to that thief. That thief did not demonstrate an iota of any labor he ever labored in the earth for the sake of the righteous. He had no works behind him, but he simply believed. And I'm telling you now, when you honestly and truthfully believe, the Lord will not abandon you. He will raise you. He will finish the work he began in you. In this world, people try to get men to follow men. That's the problem. Jesus said, come follow me. He was talking about himself. I can compliment you following Christ, but you're not to follow me, you're to follow Christ. If I happen to be walking in that same direction, well, then we can share a lot. But guess what? If somebody I know falls off the path, I will not fall with them. Do you know why? Because I'm not following them. I'm following Christ. In the Bible, with some of these shepherds, when they fall, the sheep are scattered. Why? Because those sheep were following what? The shepherd. We were told to follow Christ. If a shepherd has care over the sheep, we can still follow Christ, understanding we're under the care of that shepherd. But if that shepherd goes and does something weird, we don't follow that shepherd in his weirdness. If the shepherd gets sick, we pray for the shepherd. If the shepherd goes a little bit off the keel line, then we pray for him on that too. We do everything to bring him back. But we know who the number one shepherd is. So that when when, when you have an earthly shepherd that goes sour, you don't follow him off the cliff. Don't do that. You realize he went sour. Keep your eyes focused on Christ. Do that. Sleep deprivation, spiritual or physical. Ah, that's it. Depends. Listen, anything that takes away from your quality of life that's not somehow adding to it, because the Lord can cause conditions, right, to get you to awaken to things, to see things. But Satan is cruel, and he will attempt to do anything and everything he can do, right? To get Because if you ever agree with his weapons, those weapons will start taking place in your life right? Satan by himself can't do anything to you. So he cannot cause anything to happen to you. What he can do is to cause you to agree with what he wants to happen to you. And if you do that, it's going to start happening, right? So when you get into sleep deprivation, the root cause is the most important thing. It's the most important thing to, to actually overcome it. It's almost unnecessary to identify whether it be physical or spiritual. It's more important to say what step do you take if it's a hindrance, right? Because sometimes I'm sleep deprived for days at a time, sometimes not. Some things are purposed. If it's unlawful, then we as believers have a right to evict the individual who's causing it. But it can be handled. Yes, the first of the KD files, specifically the outline and a very important document. It's almost like a preface. You start following that. Now, these things... We'll start posting spontaneously, guys. So they, the, the first post goes up tomorrow. And I'm going to see how many people read and go through the numbers and all that before some of the bulkier ones come through. But it's going to show you some of the topics we're going to go over. But don't think it's like anything you can see out there on the Internet. Don't think it's some special thing that, you, you know, it's special, exclusive. No, not, that's not what it is. Listen to me carefully. There are people who have gone through things in this world. There are people who had jobs in this world where they went through things. Those things are going to be shared in the hopes that they would never catch you off guard, that you would overcome them, that you would begin to see the true nature of things. I don't even recommend that certain papers be read by certain types of Christians. And I outline, those are outlined. But this earth, very difficult to see. To see this earth in its fullness is a whole nother matter altogether. What you see is good to see. It is. It's good to see. You don't have to know anything about 
what's in the KD files, right? There will be other things on the site that will help a person out, but those things in the KD files are specifically for those who have dealt in certain areas, who have questions in certain areas, I mean legitimate ones that plagued him to this very day, to let them see the true nature of certain specific things. It is not some place where we put up documents to beat down somebody else's information. That's not what this is about. But there are things in this world, right, that if people don't know about them, they'll likely die by them. They will. So it is a, it is a huge move. They'll be posted spontaneously from time to time. But all of that stuff is going to be in a, you know, in the form of the KD files. I would ask when you, when you start reading the heart of the KD files, not to distribute them. I would ask that. I would also ask that people don't make a discussion of them. I really would ask that. If you read them, then simply read them. But please don't make a discussion of them. That's only, I can only, you know, throw that in there. It's up to you if you comply or not. It's up to you if you comply or not. I just, I, I, I'm just asking that people don't do that. See, because if something becomes, say something catches some momentum and gets popular, I'm telling you right now, then the rest of the publishing's for it. It's over. It's over. It is not meant to be some good read. It's not meant to be entertainment. That's not what this is. It's not meant to be any of that. This is purely spiritual. And it is to assist a person's walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ to add some visuals to the world you live in, to open it up a bit, to let you know that the Lord knew what he was talking about from the beginning. Because once you start reading them, you'll realize you've been protected this entire time. It should raise your praise level. We don't give praise to the Lord when we think, you know, he's not, he, he doesn't need to protect us from anything. Are you kidding? How many of you know about the giants in the space space missions how many know about that anybody ever heard of that you ever heard about giants on the iss or giants in the space shuttle or giants in in you know things dealing with space big people you ever heard about you ever heard that real big people we're talking about some big ones right some big people big tall people nobody heard of that huh so there are certain subjects nobody's heard of and because nobody heard of them they were never classified and because they were never classified, they were distributed and they're held. Now we're talking about the media files. Now that means all the data and information behind the media files themselves can be validated. I give an example. There's a set of 10 media files. Each media file is only about five or six seconds long. But the, this media is still on the original hard drive. Isn't that something? And it can only be transported, moved around, cannot be copied. There's no way no computer on earth is going to copy. You can't even copy that info. Right? It has to be shown by way of that hard drive. That's how it's kept. There's information like that all over the earth. There's certain families that are responsible over certain types of information. This information does not make good reads, and it will turn your reality upside down. Nevertheless, there it is. At any rate, folks, I'm not going to hold you hostage any longer. Listen, I'm going to join you all tomorrow. We have a discussion on AI. Remember that tomorrow. I'll put the times up there on the website later on. I got to get to work and get all this stuff mapped out for you guys, okay? So I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Oh, and listen, just in case we don't want to, if, uh, any of you guys know about ministries that are having anything in contradiction to our scheduling on Sunday? Let me know. We'll adjust our scheduling on Sunday for their sakes, okay? Have to do that. Have to do that. Guys, we'll see you next time. God bless you. Somebody says I can't get them. Anybody can access the KD files if you have a um, if you have any type of account with Council of Time, right? Um, you can get to the KD files. Nothing is posted yet, of course, but you can get to the KD files. You can. So they're not, you know, they're not locked up, locked away from anybody. Anybody who has an account, COT, has access to it. Anybody. Folks, God bless you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. 